thank you so much for coming uh, this evening and because we have a very exciting speaker um, tonight, a, a very dear friend and a kind of remote uh, collaborator of mine, uh, Ben Bratton, coming from uh, UC San Diego. Um, and uh, past summer when we organized our annual Proto-Ecologic Symposium in Croatia, Ben was uh, one of the main uh, uh, sort of moderators and speakers and, and the topic was the design, the field is open. And I think in uh, Ben's case more than um, uh, anyone else that I actually know this kind of idea of uh, really questioning uh, what is the agency of design at the moment and, and uh, what is the capacity of design to act across uh, the whole myriad of scales and a kind of uh, synthesizing whole myriad of agencies is very much the case. So some of the topics that I remember Ben uh, putting on the table in our discussions was, for instance, uh, the scale of geo as design uh, side, the sovereignty of the agents as a, as a design actor, and uh, or what architecture and ontology might be in the age of, uh, for instance, planetary computation. Uh, one topic that also we discussed a lot was this idea of uh, increased designability of matter and uh, how potentially the algorithm profile of matter could evade uh, necessary socio-political context. Uh, um, so this idea that, that um, there is a quote that, that Ben actually often uses uh, from uh, Frederick Kittler is silicon is nature calculating itself and uh, one part of matter calculating uh, the rest of it is, is also uh, I think a very um, strong topic at the moment and, and tonight we will be hearing a lecture on the sort of parallel universe of, of stuff or this kind of growing uh, a blooming world of, of, of uh, stack and uh, what are the, the kind of open and new roles for design in this context. Uh, recently George Dyson said uh, there really is a universe of self-reproducing self digital code and uh, when I last checked it was growing by 5 trillion bits per second. So in this kind of context uh, what kind of agency um, or, or capacity again design can assume. Um, Ben Bratton is a theorist whose work spans philosophy, art and design. Uh, he's a professor of visual arts and director of uh, uh, the Center for Design and Geopolitics at the uh, University of California, San Diego. His work is situated at the intersection of contemporary social and political theory, computational media and infrastructure, architectural and urban design, and the politics of synthetic ecologies and biologies. Um, he is just uh, writing a, a book that uh, uh, we all can wait to see, which is called The Stack on Software and uh, Sovereignty, which is forthcoming soon from MIT Press. So I won't give you uh, any more hints. I think it's best uh, to just hear them. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak with you here tonight um, to further the California, London, linked with this as well. And also thank you for the, the invitation to speak at, at Croatia. And then again, where I, I had the opportunity to uh, ventriloquize Eyal Weissman, whose Skype thing coming through is an experience I won't, uh, won't soon forget. Um, let me begin then a little bit with a, something of a disclaimer um, or confession of a sort um, about where I, uh, how I come to this point. Um, my position in relation to architecture, I suppose, has always been to some extent as a kind of an outsider who is on the inside, um, but who nevertheless remains, retains some kind of unabsorbableness. Um, not necessarily the fly in the, could, actually, could I have a little bit of light on here? Because I have a tap <laughs> here. Otherwise, it's going to get very tangential very quickly, I think. <laughs> um, thanks. Use the iPhone. Um, Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, not necessarily the fly in the ointment, um, as it's not so much about being an internal enemy of architecture, though that's not such a bad thing to be, um, though rather sort of working in the seam, seams of its evolution. So, which is just simply to say that my, my commitment to architecture, if that's the word, um, is twofold. Uh, first, it's that architectural thinking, architectural systems, and so forth, um, not to mention its physical materiality, are, are extraordinarily useful for understanding non-architectural things. And so my interest, I suppose, is to smuggle things in and out of 
the field and put them to different use. Uh, and second, um, if you examine my, if you look at my studio briefs, that, that architecture is a, a, a really extraordinarily, extraordinary excuse to explore the spatial, geometric, temporal uh, qualities and tensions of utterly non-architectural things, crowds, inappropriate biotechnology, cannibalism, unusual neurological disorders, and so forth. So for 10 years, I taught at SciArc, where I uh, helped develop, for better or worse, that school's unique portfolio of preoccupations and encounters with computationalism. And this was done as both the author of all of the XLab studio briefs and seminars, but also, as a, I suppose, as a kind of hostile witness to the ornamentalism that too often resulted from these. And at, and at the same course, I was also teaching, held down teaching theory at UCLA's design, Department of Design and Media Arts, which I still think is the best digital uh, media arts program in the world. Um, and at the same time, I was, among other things, the director of the Advanced Strategies Group at Yahoo, where I spent my time designing, on the problem of designing programs and platforms for half a billion users. Now, so for me, the, the, the question of speculative art, um, digital architecture and large-scale internet platforms were kind of fraternal projects. The point being is that my practice, which is very much is always text-driven, is based on the movement and value, the shuttling of genetic material between institutional contexts, um, trading one for the other. Um, and also because for me, it's hard not to see the connections and continuities between apparently unlike events and problems. So as whereas some are perhaps preoccupied with disciplinary autonomy, I have a tendency towards composites, alloys, aggregations, universalities, not formal systems necessarily, but composites. Um, megastructures, if you like. So now I am at, um, as Alyssa has told you, I'm at the University of California, San Diego, in La Jolla, at uh, Cal, so here's our talk. Settle in, I have a fair bit to share with you tonight. Um, at Cal IT2, uh, the UC System's flagship telecommunications and IT research institute, where I am uh, embedded on a daily basis, not by designers, um, the traditional sense, but with nanotechnologists bio in the bioengineering department. Next to the Salk Institute, where much of modern biotech was developed, uh, to, which but today works mostly in neuroscience. The Scripps Institute, which birthed much of modern climate science, inaugurated with the first Keeling curves of CO2 measurements. And opening next year, the Craig Venter Institute, where the next wave of synthetic life forms will be hatched, we assume. So at UCSD, as Alyssa said, I direct the Center for Design and Geopolitics, where Alyssa came um, last year. And it's, and it's the work and research of the center and the book around it that I want to talk to you a bit about today. DGP is a, is a think tank that focuses on how planetary scale computation both distorts and deforms traditional Westphalian modes of political geography, jurisdiction, and sovereignty, and produces new territories in its image. The focus then is, is not on policy, but on speculative art and design based on the, the art collaborations with scientists, engineers, and researchers through a wide range of disciplines. And it is in this delamination of sovereignty from geography that our interest really, our interest really lies. And it, in this, it is in the exacerbation, not the amelioration of emergencies, so as to expedite their intrinsic ability to generate alternatives. We presuppose with this that the heavy carbon economies inherited from industrialization have reached an insolvable impasse and today must be redesigned, reformed, and replaced. Furthermore, as it is now amplified by planetary scale computation, industrial modernity is now so radicalized that its ubiquity is matched only by its imminent dissolution. But other conditions are possible, they have to be. Not progress or future, but perhaps better crashes. And towards that, computation does not necessarily replace what comes before, but under the right circumstances, it can and does. And under more, more rarefied conditions still, it should. In other words, it is designed in the image of the post-Anthropocene, a term I'll come to again towards the end. Now, this question of working across scales and structures is developed in relation to this concept of the stack, 
which, um, as Alyssa mentioned, is the name of the book forthcoming from MIT Press next year, The Stack, a design brief on software and sovereignty. So my presentation tonight really um, draws from this book and from the little bits of work, from a few of the bits of work that DGP has done in relation to this program. The stack works to conceive a new model of sovereign geography for an era of planetary scale computation, one derived from existing architectures of these self-same technologies. The book threads political geography, architectural theory, and software studies, a line leading from the long foretold and longer postponed eclipse of the national border, the ascendance of political theology and existential transnationalism, of cloud computing and the depth of ubiquitous addressability, of a logistical modernity, of the endlessly itinerant object, and the return of the city-state in the guise of the multipolar network of megacities and walled mega-gardens, to the permanent emergency of ecological collapse. So the stack begins by tracing how political geography has divided territories, land and sea and air among them and draws on Carl Schmitt's book from 1950, The Nomos of the Earth, to demonstrate that each historical, model, uh, each historical model of political geography expresses not only a particular geometry of sovereign space, but also a particular topology of segmentation and jurisdiction. And that because these orders are unstable, they are redesignable. This he terms nomos. So I challenge the correspondence between the Kantian models of federal cosmopolitanism and Kant's own claims to, articula to the articulation of political expression of a Copernican rota rotation. I argue instead that another decentering, a blurring operation in political geography is necessary both to account for planetary computation and to make it accountable in turn to the designations and designs that we would have for it. For that alternative topology, the emergent geometry of political geography, I then introduce this model of the stack. It is derived both from software and network stacks, for example, the OSI model, TCP IP models, and other structural stacks, urban grid, modus vivendi, enclave theory, archaeology's Harris matrix, and, others, and, other, and so forth. And it is used to describe then how planetary computational infrastructure, both from cyber infrastructural software to interface semiotics, from submarine fiber optic cable to the flickering pulses of augmented reality, can be understood not as a hodgepodge of different machines uh, at, but at different scales, but as a coherent and interdependent system. Each of these are as different layers in a vast hardware and software stack an architecture, layers in an emergent global stack. In this, the stack is a megastructure that we are building, is the megastructure that we are building, and that is building us in its image. It is also a meta-medium through which another world can be designed. The stack is pharmacon, both powerful and dangerous, both remedy and poison, the machine of utopia and or oblivion, which after Buckminster, for Buckminster Fuller, it will be touch and go, until the very last instant. So the stack as examined here is comprised of seven interdependent layers, each of which constitutes a chapter of the book, derived from the superimposed image of the geographic and computational machines that we inhabit and the ones we might yet design. These are in order earth, cloud, city, network, address, interface, and user. Each is considered then on its own terms and also as, as a dependent layer of a larger architecture. In this, the stack is, a, is a, as I said, a megastructure, me mega technology, but particularly a technology of geography. And following Virilio's axiom that the invention of any new technology is simultaneously and inevitably also the invention of a new kind of accident, the car is the invention of the car crash, the high speed trade is the invention of the algorithmic value crash, and so forth. The inventiveness and productivity of each layer of the stack is determined by its own integral accident. Its accident is its design principle and power. And together, accident on top of accident, the stack recomposes the geometries of geography, the interfaces and epidermis that inhabit them. So again, instead of thinking of the various layers of planetary scale computation as divergent, incompatible developments, 
Instead, we wish to see them as modular components of a larger structure and system, a computational megastructure that striates the globe as it hovers above it. Like or unlike a new Babylon, it is a secondary crust, a clone city that cannibalizes its host or donor. It is a mutant splice of the megastructural utopias of Super Studio, Arcazoom, Archigram, etc., drawn in the image of, this, of the new scale of the Earth demonstrated by the Apollo 8 images, an architecture for the comprehension of Copernican scale and situation has been realized if degraded in plug-in cities like Foxconn and continuous monuments like transoceanic fiber optics. The stack then is not only technological, while, what it, while it names the organization of the planetary computing infrastructure, my purpose is then to leverage that model toward a broader design imaginary. Through the depiction of this incipient computational stack, we can still conceive another embryonic geopolitical architecture. The stack is, technolo this, this, the stack is then both technological and is the technological antecedent of another future common terra firma as the conceptual prototype and the conceptual prototype of the alien cosmopolitanisms that it might engender. This entails then and presumes a distortion or radicalization of the modern political geographic diagram, one that overwhelms, augments, and produces new territories, not as some international federation or superstate, but as something more bottom up, as more diagonal and layered geography. So this is seen for the Treaty of Westphalia codified a diagram of loops, largely contiguous states separated by lines on a plane, as a response, as Schmidt suggested, to the trouble of discontiguous sovereignty brought by colonial extension, and Kant, in turn, universalized this arrangement, giving it its foundational ethics. He defined cosmopolitanism, the polity of those who share the surface of the Earth's crust as their locale, as a federation of these national monads. But now, as then, the diagram is overrun with exceptions, from Byzantine international bodies to the proliferation of enclaves and exclaves, non-contiguous states, diasporic nationalisms, special economic zones, atavistic religious geographies, and perhaps especially global computation channels. So, then to the first layer of the stack. At the cloud layer, the first Sino-Google war of 2009 may well be the opening crack of a different kind of war over, about who or what governs society, one less between two superpowers than between two logics of territorial control. One of these sees the internet as an extension of the body of the state, or at least beneath the state in the priorities of sovereignty. Another which sees the internet as a living, quasi-autonomous, if privately controlled and profited, trans-territorial civil society, which produces, defends, and demands rights on its own. For this, Google is a non-state actor operating with the force of a state, but which, unlike modern states, is not defined by a single specific territorial contiguity. But while Google is reliant on real physical infrastructure, its empire of data centers are by no means virtual, that physicality is more dispersed and distributed than partitioned and circumscribed. So the stack then is not another prophecy of the declining state withering away into the realm of pure network, but to the contrary, that the state's pressing redefinition is in relation to network geographies that it can neither contain nor be contained by. But as the superimposition then of two interlocking enclaves, Google and China, consider the breach theory of Dr. Fang Bingjing, an academician at the Chinese Academy of Engineering and one of the main designers of the infamous firewall. He makes this breathtaking observation. In November 2001, he warned a conference the, on the, of Chinese internet designers that, that, that as, as of now, the Chinese internet does not, he laments, have the capability to disable a global internet service when ever desirable. He used the example of Google and said that it was a pity that, al that although Google had retreated from China, uh, its service was still accessible. 
It's, it's, I quote, it's like the relationship between a riverbed and water. Water has no nationality, but riverbeds are sovereign territories. We cannot allow polluted water from other nation states to enter our country, unquote. Now this is an amazingly succinct repetition of the older European nomos jurisdictional separation of land and sea into a, into the, a quasi-Confucian parable. But it is, it is just as likely that Dr. Fang is unfamiliar with Buckminster Fuller's admonition that, quote, the fearful sovereign nation politicos will find that trying to arrest networking is like trying to arrest the waves of the ocean, as it is that Fuller was never give the, given the assignment as Dr. Fang was of building a glass dome for a billion internet users. But to extend the figure of water from metaphor to real location, consider that for Schmidt's history of the nomos of political geography, that, that's Carl Schmidt, not Eric Schmidt, that the territorial geography of nations was, was and has always been defended by the naval capacity over the omnidirectional glaciers of the ocean in light of Google's filed patent on water-based data centers. This floating cyber infrastructure would, in principle, greatly reduce the energy and cooling costs of hosting and serving the petabytes and exabytes of data that will constitute an eventual cloud, cloud, planetary cloud platform. It may also symbol, symbolize a productive crisis of territorial jurisdiction, one which alters how truly pervasive computation may demand or activate new forms of agonistic and or cosmopolitan habitats. Data centers, the core, the, the core, te hard technical core of the internet, use a lot of energy, mostly to keep processors cool, and with something like only two of the world's seven billion people using the World Wide Web in any given month, the anticipated growth curve is steep. Where will the energy come from? How can Google possibly feed the energy appetite of the data centers that would provide ambient supercomputing to the next two or three billion human users and the next 50 to 500 billion objects of an Internet of Things. Oceanic data centers would theoretically solve this by using both tidal and wind energy to power the stations, as well as the abundant supply of water to assist in the cooling process. But in doing so, the literal offshoring of such critical infrastructure raises other concerns about the jurisdiction and legal control of data and the governance of this emergent cloud hoax. That offshoring neatly portends the integral accident of the cloud and of its layer in the larger stack is this, the delamination of the layers of territory and economy and sovereignty, one from the other, potentially perforating the domain of the state with the economies of non-state infrastructure beamed in from the middle of the ocean. And from here, then, the practical des political design issues only get more complex. What are the national rights of mobile subjects in a cloud-based society or economy? Can you be bound to the data laws of, the pa of your passport country, no matter where you go? Can your cloud, in other, wor in other words, can your cloud follow you and you it? Can your cloud be your primary sovereign territory, should it? Or should individual servers fly the flag of a certain state and disseminate data according to those laws, even if the server may be across the world? Or should, like Civis Roman assume, the particular data laws of a particular geography, geographic site try to construct and contain the laws of flow on one particular spot, regardless of the sovereign origins of sender or receiver? What even if the server farms are outside of territorial waters altogether? Like offshore data centers for which for, which for sensible green reason would also put the global cloud, that inf an informational third of the composite city of information, concrete, and energy outside regular territorial jurisdiction. It's not a matter of hypothesizing that planetary computation will bring the accident of alien political geography it already has. A word then on the character of that alien and what I call cloud feudalism. The nomos of the cloud, that emerge, its emergent and very much still emerging logical relationships between state, territory, water, interface point, aperture, sovereignty, citizen, user, etc., is one that may come to be defined by political and cultural architectures 
more totalitarian, if at the same time libertarian, than egalitarian. And not only because they are so compatible with existing monotheistic fundamentalisms. These and the cloud, these, these atavistic institutions and the cloud compete and collaborate with states, not only for claims over legitimate violence, but also claims over legitimate citizenship and the capacity to delineate its borders. It is less, again, that states are somehow evaporated by this conjunction of the pre-modern and the hypermodern, than that as ever their legitimacy lies with the negotiation of geographies defined by extra-governmental techniques. So to grasp the overlapping layers of the nomos of the cloud, we require a kind of post-Copernican revolution, rotation in our political geography, this time from flat to verticalized, from two-dimensional to polyscalar, verticalized, irresolved, delaminated territories, that understands these dynamics as simultaneously and interchangeably futuristic and archaic, technocratic, and theologic, for the modern diagram is attacked from both the front and the rear. At the same time that we contemplate financial archipelagos that would gain the speed of light by locating offshore trading sites uh, on, that optimize the speed of movement of pulses between market centers, where the international value of a commodity is determined by literally by its location in the Earth's light cone, and the cosmic conflict between Google and China over the political ontology of information networks. We also see Lashkar Itaiba attacking Mumbai with Google Earth Maps, satellite phones, and stolen SIM cards. For the latter, the critical insight is not that jihad could fit inside of Google Earth, but rather that Google Earth could and can fit inside of the geography of jihad. We can just as easily imagine then a cloud-based neo-medievalism or uh, or, cl or cloud feudalism, not the same thing, in both the North and the South. Visigoths with iPads, barbarian theological microstates with thriving biotech and nanotech industries, just like San Diego, perhaps. The terms of the nomos of the cloud, then, are open to designation, but supercomputing does not inoculate us from feudalism, from superstition, from aggressive political theology, but it can perhaps provide for its opposite, a futurism without guarantees, only plasticity. All right then, I want to then, to this introduction, speak to the other layers within the stack architecture, and particularly to as what I call the integral accidents, the conditions of its, how it's able to compose and offer the possibility of composition through design from it. First, the earth layer. I'm immersed in a photograph of Jill Deleuze sitting on the beach in Big Sur, California in the mid-1970s, examining its sands, its breathing striations of the silica terrain. In placing the image, I can't help but think in the next moment about the other purposes to which silica processed the silicon was just then, at that moment, being put as the physical medium of synthetic computational intelligence just up the freeway in the areas near Palo Alto, in a valley already then having been named in the honor of the substance. So the earth layer of the stack, its accident is defined by at least two things. One is that computation is itself an earthly process. It's not something that is not a synthetic invention that is superimposed upon the earth. It is intrinsic to the way in which the earth operates. And second, that the, that the calamities and crises of ecological catastrophes operating at the earthly and ecological level also are generative of kinds of jurisdictional fissures and fusions to which we must uh, attend. So as Alyssa already said, the, Hitler's famous quote, silicon is nature, silicon is nature calculating itself. If you leave out the part of the engineers who write little structures on silicon, you can see one part of nature calculating the rest of matter. Now this sort of attitude, this sort of presumption has brought with it then a whole range of, as you're familiar, of computational ontologies, of ideas that, any, that in philosophy, in neuroscience, astrophysics, and computer science itself. 
and has led to the and has led to a number of different kinds of reactions and counter reactions. Giuseppe Longo and his critique of computational reason, uh, uh, examinations of Gnostic mathematics and its capacities and its incapacities to, to collapse into into matter. Now, my point, and I think the 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 path that we're interested in is not necessarily that of the Seth Lloyd or Stephen Wolfram and that, that the universe or the earth itself or the matter is somehow reducible to computation at an ontological level, but rather simply that, cal that computation is in and of itself worldly. That algorithmicity is not some saccharine superimposition on natural processes, but the comp and that computation was not invented by Turing or anyone else, but was discovered. And we are learning to work with it and that we assume that new computational substrates will be discovered and composed that are in some way less clumsy. Now, the earth layer of the stack is then also defined by the integral, the, the integral accident of the appetite and ec economics of the smart grid. That is, the energy cost of planetary computation versus the internet of energy. And as we know, the, it, the cloud computing and data centers as an industry is already, well, is already far surpassed the airline industry in terms of its carbon footprint. At the same time as we're told by Project Smart 2020 report and others that the development of a truly smart grid that would able to introduce computational systems into an internet of energy to dis distribute electrons in the same way in which we distribute pa da packets of data would introduce, a th would introduce carbon savings three, time, uh, three times as much as the energy put into to actually realize such a, a system. The latter must save us from the former, we are to assume. We deduce that we must accelerate investment in this meta composition in order to the costs of building the stack do not sink the entire industrial enterprise at a planetary level. But if the energy and carbon costs of the stack are too great to pay for the construction of the internet of energy, then the internet of energy cannot save us from the effects of those costs. If we can't build it fast enough, then the sunk carbon costs of the internet to come and the consumption it motivates will ensure that collapse. So the gamble then is to have built the smart grid fast enough that it can save us from the carbon cost of the stack itself. The stack is in a race against itself, like the long distance spaceship that must carry a prohibitive excess of fuel just to carry the prohibitive excess of fuel. Furthermore, the stack's physical footprint itself is vulnerable to foreseeable and unforeseeable disruptions brought by climate change. This was brought home to me a couple years ago. I was on a panel with a guy named Stanley Williams, who was a research scientist at, at, at Hewlett Packard. And he was telling how he was on a, a committee that was um, commissioned by then Vice President Gore to design a theoretical computer architecture for a system, a computational system that would be able to model the climate in real time. So Williams and some of his other colleagues working on sort of the, uh, the avant-garde of computational architecture deduced that in order to produce a system like this, it, it, the computation would have to be capable of, 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 of uh, zeta flop computing. Now, exaflop computing is about the level by which the, super, the best supercomputers we have are operate zeta flop computing, so orders of magnitude beyond this. In other words, it was beyond sort of the physical capabilities. But not only that, the computer itself would be about the size of Paris. And more importantly, it itself would be the single most significant energy consumption event that it itself would be modeling within the system that it, within, within the system that it's producing. This is the problem of the smart grid. But at the same time, it also produces a kind of challenges to jurisdiction. So beyond the, the slow crawl of the citizens of, of Petro citizens of NASCAR nation. We assume then that it would also be something like an OPEC for solar, wind, and geothermal energy producing regions around the world. Some other polity that redraws the map in the images of a new global energy economy. You're familiar then, no doubt, with the, the project by AMO proposing a new map of Europe now called Eneropa, based on exactly on this same conjuncture. In their map, which is included with the final report to them, um, with McKinsey's, different areas of Europe are redrawn as Solaria, the tidal states, Geothermia, etc. In other words, a redrawing of jurisdiction around the interests of producers. But the polities of those affected are equally important. 
In the wake of recent hurricanes, New York City introduced a system of zones that differentiated proximity to rising coastal waters and vulnerability. Those living in zone A versus zone B might be required to evacuate at different times, might be recognized for different rights of return. And here, the invention of eco-jurisdiction as an ex exceptional superimposition could not be more clear. As the emergencies of these jurisdictions become increasingly permanent, the provisionality of the exceptions begins to concretize into a new territory that might make ex unexpected demands upon its neighbors and citizens. For example, the alliance of, of, the alliance of small island states emerged during the Kyoto Protocol this discussions to argue that for the interest of the 42 low-lying nations most egregiously affected by rising sea levels, this federation of mostly island states spread across the world, but concentrated along the equatorial belt, proved an aggressive voice for, for, and a formidable agent in the climate change talks. So perhaps we will see then also an alliance of those threatened by desertification, or a federation of agricultural regions overrun by migrating insects, or equally likely a league of those who will now, in a warm climate, become agricultural superpowers, like Canada or Russia or the UK, perhaps. And most strangely, then, is the, is the, are the sovereign problems posed by those populations of islands that would absolutely disappear. Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, the Maldives, Kiribati. If a nation drowns completely underwater, does it still a nation? Does it still have fishing rights? Do the citizens still have the rights and, rights and, and, and other kinds of sovereignties? These are the issues that we confront. Okay, next. On cities and skins. Some 10, 15 years ago, when the excavation took a, it was a near of time. In Turkey, a site called Gobeki Tepe was discovered. It's a ninth, it was a, a structure, a religious structure, that was dated at 9000 BC, making it older than the pyramids, making it older than what had presumed to be some of the earliest archaic states and agricultural settlements. One of the interesting things about Gobeki Tepe in terms of the way in which it confounded some of the traditional political logics of how archaic states and their use of agriculture made, made it possible for the settlements of these things, cities as a function of, this, of, of agricultural settlement, is that this was, a pin, this was a point on the horizon of a hunter-gatherer society. People would wander across the landscapes and the structure would exist as a kind of as a kind of monument, monument on the horizon, giving a kind of organization and orientation to the space. It wasn't a structure of settlement. The structures of settlement, the partition, the wall that organized the cities became subsequent. It's a derivation of this basic gesture. Today we have buildings like One Wilshire in Los Angeles, skyscrapers turned into data centers, anti-monuments to the deep invisibility, the provision of mobility, a different kind of mobility, and an aversion of the skin of governmental technique and its reversibility. Now, the model then of security and the structures of security that operate in this city has gone through a number of kinds of transformations. Now, Foucault's model, of course, is to secure, is, is a description of disciplinary structures, to secure bodies physically in space, to secure them for and from a freedom of movement, to secure them from danger or towards, towards a kind of structure. If one reads especially his later lectures at Collège de France, it appears that Foucault abandons the concept of, of war altogether, opting instead for the notion of security, which he eventually abandons as well. But in other words, Foucault does not appear at first sight to have a theory of warfare as such. Instead, he has a kind of theory of pacification and to a limited extent of militarized bodies which it based, upon, based in the image of a disciplinary structure that seeks to optimize a state, a state of life by maximizing and extracting its forces. What it extracts forces from are aleatory events, biopower, or the power to guarantee life, intervenes at the level at which the phenomena are determined. Now, we can compare the disciplinary logic of capturing bodies, holding them in place, as a logic of the partition of the city. To Deleuze's, for example, Deleuze's postscript on societies of control, this, this late essay of his now highly leveraged observation on the contemporary city and media. 
This very brief text is concerned with the transformations of cities from disciplinary modes, which Deleuze associates with Foucault, to control models, which seek not, do not directly coerce inhabitants into governable mass envelopes, because in, in essence, the very possibility of anyone's actual movements through open and closed spaces is already governable at each and every interfacial point of passage, built up parametrically through instances of gateways, identity verification, identity verification and entertainment opportunities. Control, which Deleuze defines through the addiction, debt, mimicry tropes of William S. Burroughs, has the effect of allowing a more direct oscillation between striation and smoothing as emergent techniques of spatial, social systematization and cybernetic techniques of soft management and cyclical design. And so the dichotomy between securing in place and securing in motion becomes blurred, or at least reversible. So we have with Foucault, a disciplinary structure of bodies held in place, where a, a body is free to disperse themselves in a field in which there is no possible outside, because every interface point in which they would come in contact with space, with an environment, with the habitat, and indeed within each other, becomes the point by which government is intensified into those points. This is the logic of the shift to security. Now, my argument then is that I think we need to take this rotation from the Foucauldian to Deleuzian model a step further, from enclosure to interfaces to surfaces, to, bi to the biopolitical governance of skin as a paradigm of security. Skin is more than an envelope. It is a sensory organ, much as our eyes and ears are. And whereas cinema prostheticized sight into an artificial structure and audition prostheticized was prostheticized into recorded sound. And to some extent we prostheticize skin with clothing and the south for the most part. But skin as a sensory organ has not been available to the same kind of designability and prostheticization until relatively recently how it might augment its performance. But newer technologies, particularly nanotechnologies, suggest that we might imagine the redesignability of skin in new ways. New skins that do new things, that sense the world in different ways, that are secure and insecure in the world in different ways. As a security paradigm then, the space is opened up and the space is closed off by computation, define, do they not? What, is, what, what it is that government, now instead of what governments chooses to see and not see, the James Scott model, to what governments chooses to sense and not sense. Which means that the, the appearance of skin as a security structure means, involves the, its weaponization. Camouflage is a weaponization of skin. Stigmergic communication, insects, is, an, is a weaponization of, ep, of the epidermis. It is a colonization of space through epidermal communication. But at the same time, the question of counter-weaponization, de-weaponization of skin, as a way in which to think about its role within that security and unsecurity paradigm becomes part of the design problem. So at UCSD, we, did, we began a project with the Center for Bio-Nanotechnology there. Here we are in the midst of this. I think Alyssa and Daisy are in there somewhere. So the Center for Joseph Wang and the Center for Bio -Nan Nanotechnology did a project where they were working with the US Navy to develop inks that would sense explosives in the atmosphere at, part, at a parts per trillion sensitivity. This was mostly done with the military uh, interest in mind. So they would have these little sensors on the clothing of the soldiers. They would go into an area and the sensors would smell the presence of the chemicals to straight the chemical signatures of various improvised explosive devices. And if any of those devices were in their area, the sensors would go off. The next step in the research was, again, the development of this as a form of ink, which could be applied in the form of, of for example, a temporary tattoo, which you could put on your skin. So it's one way in which we consider see that the, if we think of the ink as an extension or prostheticization of the epidermis, that the introduction of another suite or capacity of sensory capacities onto, onto the body itself, one that's already and immediately enrolled within this economy of securitization and counter-securitization. So of course we wanted to screw around with what they were doing. 
So the two quick, I'm just showing these because they were very recent. Um, the first project works with this um, question of the skin and with this extensions of the Foucauldian model of security. And also with an interest in working with environmental surfaces as a kind of augmented skin, which in, can sense and react to the presence of specific agents in their midst, but particularly with building surfaces as a kind of skin, an augmentable skin that could be re-transformed in this way. So the first project on this architectural surface where, where Foucault had once located panoptic systems, it's made it as, again, to a kind of surveillance technology. Here by the inscription of graffiti, instead of the sensor being hidden, the sensor is overtly visible, decorative even, and, for the, uh, and, and, and all for that unrecognized as a technology of control. Further, as opposed to the classical panoptic scenario, one human supervising another, here one kind of physical matter is designed to detect and calculate the presence of another matter. So here the gaze is present, but seen and unobserved, unknown, invisible because present in an unexpected way. The architecture becomes epidermal, transform, is, its epidermal character is amplified through its posture, through its rhythms, as it reacts to the building, to a, as a building that can now sense explosives, reacts or does not react depending on the use, uh, on, the, on the use of the of, of the sensory mechanism. So, in the simple sense, the thing is that the ink, the graffiti of the ink of the Fortress Foucault is is sprayed on the building. The ink is the chemical sensitive uh, explosives is sensitive ink. There's a bit of electronics in the the eye that makes it sort of the structure of the sensor. So what you have then is the sensor displayed right in front of you in a way that which, again, for all that more reason, it becomes um, unobservable. The second one, the second project in the same group um, of projects that we did with them uh, this two months ago um, was on the working with the, the uh, human skin itself. And here, the wearer of these biotattoos could physically sense the immediate presence of explosives, in particular explosives in bullets and concealed guns. The ink is developed today can then smell the ambient trace explosives with a great deal of sensitivity. And as you um, well know, the presence of battlefield-grade firearms in crowds in the United States in shopping malls, campuses, places of worship, island campgrounds, offices, um, we'll have to add elementary schools to the list, has led to an abyssal series of recent incidents where the outbursts of demented persons results in mass violence. The questions are, are such events and the dynamics of crowd and power that they exemplify even really still exceptional, or are they a new kind of sad normal? In the US, our version of suicide bombers are protected by a powerful political lobby. The Second Amendment to the Constitution has been interpreted by Congress to mean that, like 18th century yeoman farmers, today's Americans should have all but unfettered access to advanced munitions for personal use, lest European powers strike again. The issue has come to define sometimes paranoid ideas about individual sovereignty, the public good, racialized fear versus self-defense, local versus global governance. And today we ponder how it is that the legal right to be both violently delusional and heavily armed is seen as an absolute and irreducible condition of citizenship and participation in public space. So this project then inverts this position of power that individuals with concealed weapons have within anonymous crowds by utilizing the surface of the, bo the, surface of the crowd body itself, its skin, as a firearms detection technology. Once a gun is sensed by someone in the crowd, it is unconcealed and at least partially de-weaponized thereby. As a counter security medium, skin shifts from a vulnerable mem membrane to an organ of collective embodiment, communication, and consolidation. Okay. I want to then talk about addresses and addressing. The designability of addresses, and, and in this I mean really the ev in the everyday sense of a postal address assigned by the state, the postal services that print stamps, which writes cities by which writes cities in hierarchical order of streets and zone, guarantees the interoperability of transnational object distribution, which issues passports for the 
same persons, which secures the territorialization of things in motion as a function of its power. This is the occult power of the post, as we know from Pynchon's lot, crying of Lot 49. Our phones work because of mobile country codes, mobile network codes, pairing of SIM cards, phone numbers, NIC cards provide the addressability of you in motion. UPC barcodes ensure that sugar packets show up. Addresses are ontological in this regard, at least functionally so. Strange then, and as I'm sure you know, we've run out of internet addresses. Not they're all not all internet internet or possible internet addresses are being used, but they've all been allocated. The internet internet addresses, IPv4 addresses, the ones that we've been using for the last however many years, are all as of now uh, organized and governed and allocated by primarily by five transnational bodies called RIRs, re, uh, regional internet registries. And as I said, there are five of them. This is a map that you made to, to, to get a sense of who owned what. Um, Aaron is North America, ethnic is Asia, Australia. Uh, right, as you see, is, is Europe. All the IP addresses in Twitter view have been allocated through one of these kinds of structures. But as you see in this grid, each one of these little, each one of those little squares is 16 million addresses. Um, they've all been largely, they've all been completely allocated. Also a bit interesting, you see sort of this is sort of a messy area here that was before the RIR system was in place. You also see a bit more, perhaps a bit more strangely in this top left area here, some of the other owners of large blocks of addresses, IBM, DuPont, uh, Department of Defense, British uh, Ministry of Defense, MIT, Apple, Halliburton, um, and that guy. Um, apparently used for internet radio, though I think it, everyone understand, understands it to be for darknet. Okay, so it, within the IP4 address space, there's something of about four billion possible addresses. Now in a world of seven billion people, and the presumptions of an increase of an internet of things kind of universe, this is, a non, this is an, an unsustainable structure of addressability. So what are the solutions to this? Well. One of the technical solutions to this artificial scarcity is IPv6, a 128-bit address string. Okay, so you ask then, okay, so when would IPv6 run out? Well, if you were to divide the 128-bit address string by 7 billion people, it would be able to theoretically allocate something of the order of 10 to the 23 addresses per person. Now, that's a, a, an incomprehensible number. 10 to the 23 is roughly equal to the number of known stars, to the number of grains of sand on Earth. Each one of us would be able to have our own separate address for every grain of sand. Though it should be said of many orders of magnitude fewer than the possible number of books in Borges' Library of Babel. Now, so if you were to try to assign 10 to the 20 addresses to 10 to the 23 things over the course of your life, you would have to work down to the level of individual molecules, numbering things at a scale below natural perception. Addresses for individual letters in books, hairs on heads, blood cells, specks of dust. And I was interested in experimenting with, the, with this fine granularity, trying to get a picture of it in my head so that it might be at least understandable to, some of it, to me. So again, collaboration with the Nano 3 lab at Cal AG2, we wrote, a single IP address with the electron lithography beam onto a silicon wafer and then photographed it using a scanning electron microscope. That's just what you see here. The address in this picture is about 10 micrometers in width, uh, about the size of a red blood cell. And each line, the digit of the thickness of the address is about 10 nanometers in thickness. To get a sense of what the scale of granularity implied by truly deep addressability actually might be. Another project I'll show real quickly, one of our graduate students working in the same thing, built a, who's interested, really, Sam Cronick, who's really interested in the question of biopolitics, of food as, of food as logistics, and the standardization of its, of, of its forms in this regard. So this machine that he built assigns an individual IP address to individual grains of, of rice rice is loaded into the machine, it's identified, processed, and it's signed a unique individual address with a hierarchy corresponding to its variety and place of origin. 
Each, then, each grain of rice is then routed through the public internet, providing information about itself when that ad address is typed into the standard web browser. So you would type in the, an IPv6 address to whatever browser you have, and you would get an image of that grain, an image of that grain of rice. The larger questions about the production, supply chain transparencies of these kinds of models is, is the obvious implication. Now, this kind of nano objectivity, fine grain objectivity, the sort of, uh, is really only part of the story. This man of deep addressability would allow for the identification of things, yes, but with things with mass, but also, and perhaps more importantly, of the relations between things. Each letter on a piece of paper could have an address, could be addressable by any other thing that is, has address, could share real Shannon information with any other thing that has an address. But the immaterial relations between two things could be addressed as well. So there is then both a graph theory and a set theory problem at work here. So you know, this pen could have an address, but the fact that it is my pen, the immaterial fact could be addressable. The fact that the pen is here on this date could have an address, and so forth and so on. I can address a discrete thing and an abstract reverberating envelope of relations around it could extend into infinity. To extend Heidegger's dusty parable of the fourfold, the bottle of wine could have an address, but so could every, but so could any of the things the earthly processes that combine together to result in its particular thingness. Not just addressable nouns, but addressable verbs, events. Deep addressability then includes not only discrete entities, but also multiple levels of abstraction, as well as the traces of those entities, and even the abstractions that we hold for them. I could never exhaust 10 to the 23 addresses for physical things, but I could easily exhaust that many relations of relations of relations. In an instance, if one were to extend relationality, quote, all the way down into the abyss. Put another way, the exhaustion of any full allocation of IPv6 exists, therefore, somewhere between never and instantaneously. And the architecture of that middle is the design brief. So the phrase, the Internet of Things, implies a network of physical objects. And there, and, but I prefer then the more esoteric sounding Internet of Hexeities, which would include objects, but also concepts and memes, addressable at the same level, but at multiple scales through the same system. Scales blur, and what seems solid becomes fuzzy. Inevitably, we see that any apparently solid scale is in an only temporary state of resolution. So the, for the planetary stack, Ubiquitous computing is less about how my toothbrush is going to talk to my refrigerator than about, how expa than about expanding and amplifying communication between objects across multiple scales, from the very small to the very large, something at 10 to the, 10 to the 4 meters, communicating directly, exchanging real Shannon information with something at 10 to the negative 4 meters, and vice versa. Now, things in the world always communicate and exchange information. DNA, RNA, hair follicles disturbed by sound waves, sunlight exchanging information with celluloid film. Things inform one another in specific ways. And this specificity is how Mich Michel Serres defines communication, the work of Hermes. So I see ubiquitous computing not just as a new logistics, but as new literature. Massively addressable spaces is not only a way to map and describe the world, it's a creative medium in its own right. It's not only a way to describe things and lock them down by giving them a discrete number, it's ultimately a way to compose and create lines of connection, association, and metaphor. Deep addressability is an authoring medium. Deep address is not only a way to map the world, it's a way to compose the world, to create new concepts and logics of association between apparently unlike things words, ideas, and places with an alphabetic language that is also, because it is software, executable code. It doesn't just map, it draws. Okay. I wanted to show you one more of the deep address problems. We didn't have, we didn't get them back from the lab in time, but what we've, we've, 
assign IPv6 addresses to strings of junk DNA from um, synthetic DNA that we purchased through the mail. We'll find out later what that's good for, but it's, we have it. So. Okay, next I want to put the next layer up in the stack of interfaces. And then we'll conclude with, you, with, with the user. The interface then is the point, the point in the software stack where people and things touch the cloud. It's there in and as the interface that we draw the cloud as a world picture, as a cosmogram. It's there that political theology expresses and codifies the utopias where the affective intensity of iconic, symbolic, and indexical signs not only synthesize technological affordances, that is, signification, they also narrativize the meaning of possible actions that we might take, that is, significance. So, one interface avant-garde in particular blends a range of semiotic technologies with direct ideological description of the landscapes a user has inhabited. This is augmented reality, which can be defined as a set of technologies which directly project a, a layer of specific indexical and interfacial signs upon a given perceptual field of vision. AR thereby transforms the resulting landscapes into a designable instrumental frame by use of different techniques, the subtitling of object and events, the superimposition of navigation tools, the overlaying of iconic GUI menus on real world systems, the use of cinematic in insertions and elisions, and other artificial visual or auditory feedbacks through which local signification and significance are programmed. As the interface layer within the stack, augmented reality performs the imagistic and linguistic mediation between users and the ubiquitous computational capacities of their habitats, one layer below. As a design space, it is a platform for staging, animating, composing, and accounting for communication between users and their worlds. And unlike mechanical or screen-based user interfaces, it performs this as ambient, artificially embodied perception. It is a physical cinema in which the space of fantasy as for the traditional Christian Metzian economy of psychoanalytic projection, is for better or worse, collapsed. Now, well, I define interface, you can, again, you define interface as any point of contact which governs the condition exchange between two complex systems. Within AR, the dominant mode of the, of the interface, that is the GUI, the icon which when clicked and it, it then initiates a feedback loop, melts so it seems, into reality itself, and is perceived as a direct property of surfaces, things, events. That melting becomes the scope of design, the register of work, the touch point of advertising, and even perhaps especially the domain of activist theology. Zizek's Lacanian inversion of the real as that which is dependent upon fantasy is here given a literal, if dull, gloss. We might also say then, in tribute to Friedrich Kittler's association of film with the imaginary, typewriter with the symbolic, and the gramophone with the real, that this could be reworked in augmented reality such that the imaginary is so directly inscribed in the symbolic that the content of the interface, as the content of the interface, that the real is also itself collapsed into the imaginary, making the reality of augmented reality irredeemably occult. How so? Well, the most important imminent accident, integral accident of augmented reality, is, I suppose, a deeply granular and pervasive advertising. Here's Sergey Brin with Google Glasses riding in New York subway earlier this week. By which uh, advertising by which our embodied perception and gestures gener generate the monitorable exchange value of, of, of the network user profile. AR is where micro-targeting business models of cognitive capitalism melt into the choreography of the user subject. The work that the user subject already does to perfect targeting algorithms for search engines is then scaled from finger points and clicks to the very musculature and dance of dwelling itself. However, I fear that ultimately a less secular danger is latent in AR and that its most killer app is not marketing but fundamentalist religion. 
AR promises the design of a differential sacrality where the Schmittian, Manichaean political theological segmentation of the polis into friend and enemy becomes a direct and literal annotation of the life world. The subtitling of clean and unclean, ours and theirs, sacred and profane, empire and rebel forces, orc and not orc, red team and blue team. So, last couple of weeks ago, what sounds to this? Do we have sound on? So a couple of weeks ago, Google released its first AR game called Ingress, um, which is available for. Yeah, I'll start it over. So the Google's first foray into AR is based on a kind of paranoid religious warfare. Shouldn't be too surprising. Um, the question then, will mature, in what, not when, but uh, not, not if, but how mature augmented reality will initiate a wave of bizarre new sects, cults, activist versions of fundamentalist monotheisms, for which the metaphorical nuance of holy books is collapsed by the direct imprint of virtual worlds onto real things. There's certainly indications so. We can see the use of Google Earth, Google Maps, stolen SIM cards, and other advanced but off the shelf spatial command and communication technologies by Lashkar et Taiba during their attack on Mumbai in 2008 as a prototype of the kind of weaponized augmented reality we should fear. It's a more violent and extreme version of the creationist video games for the homeschooling economy or the Christian AR overlay of the Grand Canyon in Arizona, which explains how the canyon proves creationism and disproves evolution for those willing to look through the lens and see what it sees. Phone apps, phone apps that give Kibla directions or which allow users to scan barcodes to determine if products are kosher or halal or vegan, or free range, or GMO free, or if someone is a suppressive, or if they are a Cylon, or if you are a Cylon, if someone else believes in God, suitable for whatever frame of moral reference, seem like benign and obvious innovations. And one hopes that the poetry of these monotheistic co excuse me, cognitive cultures can withstand the unambiguous cybernetic literalism that augmented reality might afford them, and the violence that absolute explication can demand. So it must be said then at this point that regardless of the utterly computational form of the stack, 
the geoscapes generically do not require anything like modern interfaces to organize the antagonistic of geography. Surely maps, ancient, pre-modern, early modern, proto-modern, what have you, are already pre-computational interfaces that conceived a world image and a world space striated by longitude and latitude, even possible for their sacred and secular period, in which in their notation indexed what spaces were full, what were empty, and how to get there from here. So in the latent theological imperative of augmented reality, nothing so much as late medieval after images are now poured into the optical technologies of artificial vision. Okay, the last layer in the step, and I'll go quickly through this, is the user. Subjects are always constructed in relations to available technologies of the self over, uh, and the self of reflection, from Lascaux to portraiture to today's quantified self. User, the design for the user, user-centered design, what the user wants, track the user, and so forth. The user is born, of course, of Dreyfus's industrial design, the subject figure, it, 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 as, a, as, a, as, a kind of, um, as a kind of living automaton. The user as a subject figure of the stack is then a kind of dummy sovereign in a network that holds up an empty spot for him at the head of the table which put, and which puts words in his mouth. Now, going through this quickly. The question then though for the stack is that how is that the user is in fact that the human centered design, the logic of, the, of humanism and human utilitarianism at the core of the construction of the user has been surpassed by non-human and inhuman subject user positions. Animal, algorithms, the majority of traffic on the internet as of today is initiated not by people but by bots already. Machines themselves, California has passed a law allowing Google, Google's driverless cars on the road. The user is an inhuman position. And it's humanism is graphic. Now, part of the quantif what it, it particularly Californian phenomenon, but that of the quantified self, the maniacal gathering of information, the fabrication of self interpolation, of gathering of data about themselves, is in a way a kind of transformation of existential subjectivity into the par into the structures, epistemic structures of the of the user of the user, a hyper individuation of self objectification, perfectly timed to the overlap zones of transhumanism and Atlas Shrugged. But there is for the quantified self and the user a kind of misrecognition at work, an, an analog of Lacan's mirror stage, whereby the visual coherency of the body as, reflect, as reflected back is taken to locate the psychological co coherency of the self staring at it. But instead the user is really haunted by the Theseus paradox. Theseus paradox, of course, refers to that the components of any object are replaced one by one. Does the object itself still retain its objectness, its thingness? You replace the axe, the, replace the axe handle five times and the axe head three times. Is it still the same axe? This is the condition of the of the quantified self. The ultimate effect of the inclusion of information from extrinsic and internal sources into an economy of identity also has the opposite effect of contiguity, a vanishing of outlines. To the extent that the composition of the user as a biopolitical subject also includes vectors of, of extrinsic data, genomic, microbial, microeconomic, meta-ecological, into the living diagram of interpolation, the sight of the user is so infused as to as overcome with extrinsic flows of multiple scale that the coherency and stability previously invested liquefies and perforates. The argument quickly goes something like this, that the increased intensity and granularity of reflexive techniques of self-diagramming results first in the strengthening of the experience of self-coherency, but then after a further increase in those techniques, so passing as yet some unnamed threshold point, self per se begins to crash, and the experience of the living information diagram of the world is one of dissolution and perforation of self towards a more empty flux. Okay, I'm gonna, in the interest of your patience, I'm gonna go to the conclusion.
The erasure of the self by the overinscription of information introduces a principle of negation. And this principle of negation from the full or the fully empty extends to the alien cosmopolitanism of the stack. Deep systemic crises invite three interrelated and apparently opposing responses, acceleration, inertia, and fundamentalism. Fight, hide, and flight accordingly. Toward this, we recognize the emergence of another alternative in human modernity, where industrialization provided heaviness, expansion, production, and consumption. Its augmentation by a successor modernity is one of lightness, contraction, involution, displacement, restoration, deterritorialization, dissipation, trauma, escape velocity. It's a subtractive modernity not of identity and maximalization within a closed field, but of externality and transference in an open plane. Where industrialization was a modernity for tabula rasa, today a subtractive modernity works within a world, a cosmos that is infinitely full or empty. Its radicality is not drawn from the historical or geographic momentum of a new world that invites utopian totalities to fill its false vacuum, but rooted in the precarity of multiple globalizations that are as irresolvable as they are interconnected. For the past 10,000 years or so, the Holocene era represented a particular geologic economy of climate, flora, and fauna. The past 150 years, the time of modernity proper, has seen such a radical transformation in the character of the planet's crust, climate change, population growth, deforestation, ocean acidification, asphaltization, massive extinction, changes so profound and permanent that another geologic era has been established. What my colleague at UCSD at the Scripps Institute, Paul Crutzen, calls the Anthropocene. In this, the bad news is obvious. The good news to be drawn from the idea of the Anthropocene is that it is, quite fa is, is, it is in fact quite possible to redesign a planet. We've done it before very quickly, and now to keep it going, we have to do it again. But when or how? After the end of one world, the Holocene behind us, the post-Anthropocene in front of us, what's the plan? I think a programmatic reconfigurability, a rearrangement of things in place, a universal, a universal contingency of form and information, a general economy of plasticity, I don't mean the plastic that comes bubbling up out of the ground for millions of years of past biomass, but rather the changeability of matter at all scales. Put differently, the big, big design problem on which we are all collaborating is less how can we produce some new condition to emerge, quote, in the future, it, later in time, always some postponed event. But instead, uh, but instead, and this is the crux of the scales around which the stack is oriented, the program isn't to design the postponable future, but rather here in space, through the reorientation and combination of things across the scales of their interaction. Now, for me, the term post-Anthropocene has certain advantages over, say, post-capitalism, to identify that project. First, is that what appears next, the specter that is really lurking, is not named or nameable because it is in some way unthinkable, multiple, and not given to singular nouns. But more importantly, because it suggests something other than the humanist economic frame as the historical scale and scope of the problem solution matrix. The communization of the means of production is a trivial, local, not universal operation because human labor does not precede machine labor, and because human animal life is not primary to the synthetic, etc. And this is where Occupy Wall Street heads for the door. The post-Anthropocene does more, rotating design both out of the human historical time as well as human historical centricity. Now, specifically for architecture, its implications are profound, but paradoxical. It's really not a matter of aligning with a movement, 
within a professional genre than asking what happens to architecture after the end of the world. Today, it seems to me that architecture is cornered. It's cornering itself. Its technical, capability, its technical capabilities are incredible, and not just in terms of the Moore's Law of surface geometry that brings us parametricism, and certainly not the Germanic movement makers who think they are its heroic vanguard, taking the same victory lap over and over after everyone has left the field. Architecture's bond with the anthrop Anthropocene and capitalism, yes, puts it in the same crisis position as other institutions predicated on the idealization of intensive production. There aren't the resources to support another 150 years of architecture as it has existed. We can only spend that much carbon again if we never go outside the glass dome again. And in this, parametricism is only useful if it is building artificial climates, not opera houses. But closer at hand, production itself is on the verge of its own little singularity in the convergence of widespread robotics, 3D and 4D printing, and personal drones. Capitalism has no idea how to absorb the disruption to labor markets and to manufacturing that this represents, and neither does architecture, though individually some architectures, architects just might. These represent a crisis of production, but also a crisis of space. A society as a whole asks software to accomplish what it is traditionally asked of architecture, namely the programmatic organization of human and objective situation. The radical automation of those situations fundamentally disrupts what we know about strategies of partition, enclosure, flow, linkage, etc. What or who exactly needs enclosure? Chinese factories, will they even exist just to make more manufacturing robots and more 3D printers? Biometric network architecture, but for what? With open source 3D printable Ebola downloadable from the Pirate Bay, what is architecture's interest in synthetic biology? It's post-anthropocenic, that's what. Architecture needs more and better villains. It needs better complexes and syndromes, a better, more primordial sense of time, rubbing the clinamin raw, as it were, a better Ballardian materialism. It needs thousand-year projects, projects that take 10 years are disposable. Projects designed to exist for 10 seconds or 0.01 seconds are important too. It's the middle humanistic tempo of 10 to 50 years that's to be avoided. If the brief calls for a 10-year solution, provide 100. If 100, provide 1,000. A project needs to work across multiple spatial scales at once, at the very least 10 to the 9th meters to 10 to the negative 9th meters. None of this 1,000 square meters stuff. It needs acceleration beyond Earth and earthiness, including beyond the moon, that dumb homunculus, that planetoid teratoma, broken off, dead twin hanging in space. Think subtractive. Pursue evil designs with a presumption of their ultimate reversal. Do projects just to get them out of the way so that no one has to ever do them again and something else has room to arrive. Use your computer more like a microscope and telescope than a lathe or a calculator. Think in terms of stacks and scales, not sites. Sites are a legal fiction, not an architectural one. Avoid wit and irony. Cultivate awkwardness, pun, obtuseness, contradiction. Pursue new accidents, presume massive accidents and work backwards. Think post-Anthropocene, think comparative planetology. And so the accidents keep piling up, the jurisdictions more interwoven, the alien cosmopolitanism is more plural, more contradictory, more composite and polyscalar. And if Virilio's axiom is true that the invention of any new technology is also and inevitably the invention of a new kind of accident, then the opposite holds, that the invention of any new accident is also the invention of a new technology. Thank you.
Does anyone want to go second? Yes, yes, I do, actually, um, which is why I've spent so much of my time in architectural schools in particular. Um, I think that, quite honestly, where, and I don't think it's, I don't think it should be news to anyone, but I think that the, that the situation in which we are located, the race which we find ourselves, this race to build the system fast, fast enough so that it might save us from the system that we built before, mm -hmm. is an extremely precarious position. Mm -hmm. And one over which no, no mode of governance will be able to contain or designate its outcomes one way or another. The best we can hope for, I think, are happy accidents. And to a certain extent, the, the more things that we produce, the greater heterogeneity of accidents we might anticipate, some of which we might be able to latch onto and scale up as infrastructure, as civilizations, as ways of life. For me, architecture, and, and again, you know, I think that the question of this, of the modeling of the accident, the modeling of the thing, is a question of prototyping. It's a question of projection, of being of, of essentially trying to circumscribe and focus on a particular nexus of a problem to try to identify the variables that define the problem at multiple scales and to intervene with projections about the possibility of its evolution for better or for or better or or, or for worse so for me it's precisely the omnivorousness of architecture the top of the funnel of architectural thinking, where everything has been able to bring to bear on the possibility of the conception of the, of the project that's extraordinarily necessary. It's not necessarily then about the bottom of the funnel where a result might be inserting more things into the built environment as being the outcome of those kinds of investigations. So this is, so again, to be perfectly plain, as I said at the beginning, for me, th my interest in architecture is to some extent to steer it towards other pro types of projects, other types of outcomes, and, you know, I'd certainly, it's, you know, this isn't news, architects has been interested in all kinds of things for quite some time, but, yeah, I would answer your question both affirmatively and optimistically, and would underline the necessity for those kinds of, uh, for, the, for that kind of work. Precisely because the systems that need to be conceived, the systematicities need to be conceived, the structures that need to be conceived and prototyped um, are ones that are desperately needed, but not just within the domain of, of the architecture, which is why, I, to some extent, I get particularly, um, um, you know, I, I have a particularly lack of patience with certain theorists within architecture who are, who are, um, congenitally defensive about architecture's autonomy, as if architecture's autonomy is this, it, in order to protect the professional stature of architecture within the continuance of an anthropocenic global economy were even an option in the first place. 
It's not an option. As a, as a, it, its mechanism in our design has to be much more um, promiscuous and hopefully optimistic at the same time as well. Yeah. Sure. Perhaps related to that, this idea of uh, if architecture has one superpower, that is that uh, it's good at synthesis. Without a doubt, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a doubt, and I think you see this. You know, this is why, you know, I'm, I'm identifying trends that are sort of already exist. But again, yes, it's the, it's the splicing of problems that exist across other kinds of scales and understanding their their condition, their conditions and relations by which they're can couch one another and cause one another and to solve one another that's, that's enorm enormously important. Yeah. yeah the other one is obviously yeah. legibility or comprehensibility of, of systems because the noise that we are facing in a kind of large data pool and all of this uh, uh, somehow architect's ability to maybe flush out legibility is another. If we will try to somehow be more optimistic in terms of all of the potential superpowers. Mm -hmm. I'm not against legibility. I'm not. I don't. And I think the legibility, to the extent to which something requires a certain kind of of um, predictable utility, legibility is absolutely um, necessary. And also, yes, to the extent to which the systems, the systems in which we're situated, are so irretrievably complex that to intervene in them and to even understand the condition of our of our situation requires. Um, technologies of making legible that we may have previously been able, been able to do without and certainly architecture's ability to to um, um, to to figure and configure systems in that regard is is eno enormously important at the same time I would say that the actual effect and performance of the systems that are let loose in the world and their ability to actually have effects that we may find desirable even if those systems and their effects are illegible, it's still more important. I would rather have illeg I would rather have better illegible systems than crap legible systems. No, but yeah. I mean, this visualization of information. Visual, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Science. I think that it probably does, yeah. And I think probably in terms of its capacity. Because you, mm -hmm. you talk about this desirability of, of matter. Yeah. And, and increased kind of desirability. And I would rather talk about maybe word design in this context than architecture because it's okay. a little easier to see uh, these different domains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Architecture is very well in capital A. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I have a question about politics, actually, and where politics lies in the conclusion of uh, this paper. Um, yeah. And so the question is, this, the way that you conclude the paper seems to be a series of solutions also manifests for possible solutions to the Anthropocene problem. Um, Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it seems to be that these solutions rely on a kind of post positive world. And they rely in a world, on a world that um, doesn't understand itself through natural boundaries, government laws, those sorts of things. My question is is this a necessary kind of jump across politics mm. because the Anthropocene, yeah. the Anthropocene is non, is non governmental? Non -governmental. So thank, thanks for the question because it lets me clarify the point. Um, it, 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 I would want to first make sure that, that it's understood that, my, that the argument I'm trying to put forward is not that the emergence of planetary scale computational infrastructural systems and so that the stack somehow liquefies the power of the state. It, it's, it, it does sometimes, and sometimes it absolutely concretizes and amplifies it and, and, and makes it much, much stronger than it may have, may have other been. It may make its grasp on the territory that, that it claims even stronger. Yeah? And we see this in, you know, 
Iran's targeting of social media after the collect the last election of Ahmadinejad, and there's it's different sorts of ways. There's no way we can think about cloud computing systems as a, as a large scale infrastructure without also thinking about them as a state surveillance op apparatus at the same time. Okay. So that's the first point. Second point is that, um, is that the, the poli politics has always been to a certain extent post-political. I, th I think the idea that, we are, that secular nation states, Westphalian secular nation states, ever really had a monopoly on the, and the, the irreducible antagonisms between imagined communities and the suppression of those antagonisms was probably fictitious. So that the emergence of atavistic transnational religious communities, for example, on, on, on let's say the rear guard, and um, uh, cloud-based models of post-citizenship, whatever you want to call it, on a sort of, the, a, a sort of a front guard, shouldn't be seen as some kind of postmodern, some sort of uh, postmodern novelty, but rather the, um, the the sort of amplification and bubbling to the surface of processes that were that were already there. But for me, it's particularly the the, the, the it's it's the it's the ease and compatibility between the front guard and the rear guard, as we see with Google's. I mean, the Google's completely um, psychotic AR religious warfare game they sort of to do. The compatibility between the, the, the pre-modern and the hyper-modern that is, some, is, is probably part of a kind of a crucial um, interpretive uh, building block, if you sort of say, to understand what the political even is at this point, at this point going forward. So there's a few ways in which we would, I guess, then to sort of question the, question the notion of the political in the first place. You know, it, it's a historical term that sort of that differentiates certain kinds of things, certain kinds of activities, certain kinds of persons, certain kinds of animals, certain kinds of economies, certain kinds of cultures, gestures, as being of the world but not of the polis. And you know, everyone from Bruno Latour to Donna Haraway to Isabel Stengers to Chantal Mouffe has been working in different ways of thinking about how to expand the. The, 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 the metabolic boundaries of, of the polis to include more things within this, within this logic, whether that's, a antagon, whether that's a purely agonistic logic for MOOF or a, or a par parliamentary logic for Latour, and so, and so forth and so on. I would just say that you know, um, the political, as I'm, I'm interested in, is in, in here, has less to do with the formation of institutional structures that would, that would embody and decree laws to give order and structure to these kinds of processes. Because for another other things, that a lot of those kinds of orders are built into protocols and systems in, in and of their own right, regardless of any, in, any kind of decree. Then it is simply with the capacity, and this goes to the question of design, to the designability of these systems in the first place. The question of who and what and under what conditions can systems that exist, can, can, can structures and systems and networks and, and yes, architectures beyond the most local, the local scale, instantiate and defend and enforce themselves in the, in, in the world. What are the mechanisms for, again, let's say, not for design at a geopolitical scale, but for the design of the geopolitical um, a, as a sort of structure of this kind of architecture as well? All of which is to say is that, it, one, the argument is not about that we have, we have passed the age of politics. But, and second, the, the answer to the question is, is that um, geopolitics would be a good idea. We should invent it. So I think there's some, yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to go through. I, went, I realized I was way over time, so I went through that section very fast. So I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to explain. About the question and the point you made about the subject of the construction relations of the political and the technologies. Of self reflection. Technologies of self reflection. That's right. What we call smart or intelligent devices. So 
Right. Well, it's, um, I'll try to answer quickly, but um, it's, an, it's an excellent question. In particular, in this, in what I was, if I had edited this a little bit better, what I would have spoken to in terms of this question of, of the quantified self and big data, the re relation of data about the self and the ways in which the self as a, as a user is constructed through the shadows and profiles of the data that we shed. Right? So within the quantified self movement, and again, this may be just a, a California thing to, to a certain kind of degree, you've got people who, who really maniacally capture and quantify and track the information about their daily performance, borrowing techniques from supply chain, from supply chain software, from, from different kinds of systems performance structures. I have a, um, a colleague of mine, very, very smart, dear man, who has Crohn's disease and is, is an astrophysicist and he's deduced that part of the real conditions in managing his Crohn's disease is in the, the, is in the modulation of the genome of the microbial biome that lives in his gut. So he sends his feces off every two weeks to a lab to be analyzed and sent back and he's got all these sort of structures and graphs by which analyzing the, micro, the microbial genome in his, in his feces and structure as well. So the argument that I was simply trying to make with this as well is if we want to take the data as a technology of self-reflection as opposed to the mirror, for example, that we see a kind of process, a kind of threshold process at work. That initially in the intensification of the reflections of data, that the fiction of the self the fiction of the coherency of the ego becomes greater. You actually believe, the more data you have about yourself, the more you actually believe that you exist as a singular trace of an entity. However, this reaches some kind of threshold point by which in the accumulation and over-accumulation and over-accumulation of data, data that isn't particularly individuated, ecological information, genomic information, so forth and so on, that like a canvas that's overpainted and overpainted and overpainted, a kind of dissolution of the self and the user takes place. And that a kind of perforation liquefaction takes place. So that was the one point. To your point, I think a bit more simply in terms of death of user, it really could be called death of the human-centered user, which is to simply to say that of all of the systems that we have tradition designed around humans for human-centered user design, the users aren't humans. They are cars, they are algorithms, they are bots, they're sp spam bots, they're animals, other kinds of things as well. And that we need to actually, we need to sort of account for this, that post-human-centered the, 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 uh, post design as a, kind of model, as a kind of model for the structures here as well. So I'm trying to be very succinct, but we can follow up the point, yeah. I just realized what's the time, so I think we have one more question. But let me, uh, let me, to follow up, just in case anyone wants, also, yes, let's please take at, one, at least one more question, but um, contact information as well, if we follow up that way. We're good? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.